Chapter 4 When to Mentor, When to Fire Jocko Willink The Malab District, East Ramadi, 2006 I heard gunfire in the distance. It was an effective fire. No rounds were impacting in our immediate vicinity. But it was a reminder that at any moment we could find ourselves in serious trouble. Threats were everywhere. Every footstep could potentially trigger an IED. Every window might be a sniper firing position. Even the sky itself could rain down deadly mortar fire at any moment. All these threats, and even the thought of such dangers, produced fear. But while we were on patrol, fear was not our focus. The focus was the job, the task immediately at hand. Cover a corner, sprint across a street, hold security on a door or a window, check your field of fire, maintain visual contact with the seal in front of you and the seal behind you. Note the buildings and streets as you pass by to keep aware of your position on the battlefield. Listen to the radio in your ear with updates of friendly locations and suspected enemy movements while also listening for threats in the streets and surroundings. With all that going on, fear couldn't occupy much mental real estate. There wasn't time to dwell on it. But occasionally, on patrol, I detached and observed not just my surroundings, but also my teammates. In those moments, our task unit bruiser seals were an amazing sight to behold. Like a single organism functioning as one. When one weapon moved away from a threat, another picked it up. When one man stepped into a danger zone, he was covered by his shooting partner. Movement took place without any verbal communication, no voice or radio calls, just subtle head nods, the way a weapon was pointed, occasional hand gestures, and well-understood body language that directed the team in a manner that others could barely detect. I was proud to be a part of this team. We functioned so well together, we seemed to operate with one mind and I had complete trust and confidence in the skills and competence of everyone in the task unit. But it was not always like that. Before our deployment to Ramadi in the spring of 2006, through 12 months of difficult training, we had worked hard to achieve that level of teamwork. Although we all shared a common baseline, having been through basic underwater demolition SEAL training, known as BUDS, the SEAL Basic Training Program, that was where the similarities ended. SEALs come from every imaginable socioeconomic background, from every part of the country, every ethnicity, and creed. Contrary to popular belief and the common depictions in movies and television shows, SEALs, like all other members of the U.S. military, are not robots. Even through the indoctrination of the different military services boot camps, the continued training, lifestyle, and culture that permeated the minds of military service men and women, the people in the military are just that. People. They have different drives and motivations. Unique senses of humor, varied backgrounds, different religions, and different personalities. They also have different strengths and weaknesses in their capabilities. The SEALs and Task Unit Bruiser contained a wide variety of athletic abilities. Some were like endurance athletes, lean and svelte. Some were like weightlifters, bulky and powerful. They also had different cognitive abilities, different intelligence levels, each handled stress differently and exercised different abilities to process complex problems. With such variation in individuals on the team, the challenge for any leader was to raise the level of every member of the team so they could perform at their absolute best. In order to do that, a leader must make it his or her personal mission to train, coach, and mentor members of the team so they perform to the highest standards, or at least the minimum standard. But there is a dichotomy in that goal. While a leader must do everything possible to help develop and improve the performance of individuals on the team, 
A leader must also understand when someone does not have what it takes to get the job done. When all avenues to help an individual get better are exhausted without success, then it is the leader's responsibility to fire that individual so he or she does not negatively impact the team. Of course, firing people is one of the most difficult things a leader must do. In Task Unit Bruiser, where a strong esprit de corps quickly developed, this was especially difficult. People often wonder how to develop unit camaraderie. We learned one of the best ways is simple, but not easy, hard work. In any organization, and especially in the military, the harder a unit trained, the more its members were pushed, the tighter they became. That is true in the broader military and certainly within the special operations community. Task Unit Bruiser was no exception. Of course, we developed powerful relationships through living, working, eating, partying, working out, and being around each other almost 24 hours a day for weeks at a time. But the most important factor in our becoming a tight-knit group was the way we pushed hard during training. We wanted to be the best. We didn't want to be second place in anything. So we pushed each other hard and held the line, and we also protected one another like a family. Unfortunately, not every member of the family had the capabilities to perform to the task unit bruiser standard. The six-month pre-deployment training workup in the SEAL teams is mentally and physically challenging, especially for those going through it for the first time, the new guys, or FNGs for short. Live fire and maneuver, weapons handling, patrolling on night vision, the weight of the gear, the heat and the cold, the lack of sleep, none of it easy. And when combined, it can be too much for some individuals. In Task Unit Bruiser, when our workup kicked off, our first block of training was out in the hot desert of Southern California where we conducted land warfare training. It was mountainous, rocky, and rugged terrain. We always said that land warfare training in this environment was where men became frogmen. The high-stress, dynamic environment posed challenges for all, but particularly for some of the new guys. As task unit commander, I paid attention to who struggled and watched how each leadership team of my two platoons handled its underperforming members. As I watched Leif, Seth, and their SEAL platoon chiefs interact with the members who were subpar, they led just as I expected them to. They tried to help less stellar performers get up to speed. There were a couple of new guys in each platoon who didn't quite get it. They seemed unable to keep up with the progression of the skills required to do the job. But I saw the platoon leadership work with them, tirelessly counsel them, coach them, assign more experienced SEALs to mentor them, train them, and retrain them. And I knew why. The new guys they were helping might be struggling, but they were still part of the platoon. They were SEALs. They'd graduated from BUDS and SQT, which is SEAL Qualification Training. They were members of the gang. And the leadership wanted to protect them and see them succeed. Fortunately, the time invested in the struggling new guys seemed to pay off. Everyone successfully completed the multi-week land warfare block of training and then the next multi-week block, mobility training, where we learned to shoot, move, and communicate from Humvees instead of on foot. During that block, I again saw some of the new guys struggling, making mistakes with the heavy weapons, not reacting properly to tactical commands, or hesitating to take action at critical moments. But once again, I saw the platoon leadership and other experienced SEALs in the platoons take ownership and rally around their young teammates, relentlessly working with them to get them up to speed. After mobility training, I talked to Leif about the SEALs who were floundering. What do you think? I asked. A couple of those guys seem like they're having a hard time. They are, he replied, but we'll get them where they need to be. That was exactly the answer I thought he would give. He was protective of every member of his platoon. After all, they were his men. He was responsible for them. And he and his platoon would make sure they got up to speed. 
I was happy to hear Leif taking ownership of the performance of his men and confident in the ability of his platoon to get every member to perform to standard. It was exactly what a leader should do. The next block of training was Close Quarters Combat, or CQC, where we learned to clear hallways and rooms in an urban environment. In the CQC training block, the pressure increased even more as the platoons executed dynamic, live-fire drills in confusing, complex buildings. Live fire meant SEALs were shooting lethal ammunition just inches apart from each other as they moved through the house and engaged targets. It was challenging and fun for most, but for some SEALs who struggled, the pressure was overwhelming. It was here that Leif first voiced a concern that perhaps one of the new guys in his platoon, Charlie Platoon, might not have what it takes to conduct such missions in actual combat. He approached me to talk about one of his men, a young enlisted SEAL whom we called Rock. Rock was a new guy, fresh out of Bud's training, and Charlie Platoon was his first SEAL platoon. He had never been through the training cycle before, and he seemed to be having some trouble. He tries hard, Leif said, and everybody likes him. We've been working with him. You've seen us. But he's struggling even more here at CQC. It seems like he might be in over his head. Frankly, I'm just not sure he's ever going to be capable of deploying to combat with us. What do you mean, I asked. He's in good shape and a hard worker, right? I knew Rock was physically capable and had a great work ethic. It's not that, Leif replied. He's got heart and he is physically tough but he's having some real problems. We got him through land warfare, where he had a little more time to think. But here, he gets completely overwhelmed when the pressure is on to make split-second decisions. And he panics and freezes up. Or makes really bad decisions in the house. I knew neither one of those was good. The house is what SEALs commonly call a kill house a building with a complex floor plan of rooms and hallways with ballistic walls that allow for live fire training and room clearances in close quarters. In the house, dynamic tactical situations unfolded quickly, demanding that split-second decisions be made at the individual level by shooters in the rooms. Because buildings were divided by walls that blocked visual and verbal communications, There were times when junior SEAL operators had to make decisions that impacted the direction of the entire operation. So every individual operator needed the tactical and operational savvy to make important decisions quickly and confidently. On top of the stress of decision-making, because of the high-risk nature of live-fire training in close quarters, there were very strict safety protocols in place to ensure no one got hurt or killed. If any of us violated the rules, the SEAL instructors issued a safety violation, a citation that documented the discrepancy. Getting a safety violation or two was problematic, but if a SEAL went beyond two safety violations, it was a major red flag that might get him ejected from the platoon and could cost him his career as a SEAL. What kind of problems is he having, I asked. He's had some major safety violations, Leif replied, and he doesn't seem to be learning from them. He's not making improvements. Rock tries, but when there's any pressure applied to him, he quickly gets task-saturated. Task-saturated was a term we used in the SEAL teams to describe how an individual or a team could get overwhelmed when multiple problems were encountered simultaneously. They couldn't properly prioritize and execute. Trying to process too much information at once, they broke down and either failed to take any action or made a bad decision that put them at risk along with the team or the mission. I understood this was a major problem, but I also wanted to be absolutely sure that everything possible had been done to help Rock improve before consideration was given to firing him. Leif and his platoon chief, Tony, were strong leaders, both high performers who expected the individuals on their team to perform. And most of their SEALs in Charlie Platoon were outstanding. But with strong leaders, I knew there could sometimes be a tendency to fire someone who underperformed before he fully had a chance to improve. 
I knew Leif and Tony and the rest of Charlie Platoon were doing what they could, but I wanted to ensure they completely understood. Most underperformers don't need to be fired. They need to be led. Have you talked through it with him? Helped him out? I asked. What about Tony? In order to ensure Rock received the full benefit of the coaching and mentoring he needed to get up to speed, I wanted to make sure my good friend and tactical expert, Tony Afratti, Charlie Platoon's chief, who was a highly experienced SEAL with multiple deployments overseas, had been working with him. As a training instructor, Tony had taught just about every block of advanced training, and I knew he would have the best chance of getting through to Rock. Absolutely, Leif replied. Chief is doing everything he can. So am I. So is our leading petty officer. We've tried hard to get him up to speed. We had some guys working with him through the weekend when everyone else was out partying. But Rock just doesn't seem able to cut it. I don't know how much more we can do. The consternation in Leif's face made it clear. He was trying to balance the dichotomy of leadership between coaching and mentoring and making a decision to get rid of someone. You think we need to let him go? I asked. I think it might be best, Leif said somberly. It wasn't an easy thing. Look, he's a great guy, Leif continued. He works hard, and I'd like nothing more than to see him succeed, but in real combat scenarios, he'd be at serious risk to himself, to other guys in Charlie Platoon, if we put him in a position where he has to act decisively. I understood exactly where Leif was coming from, and he was right. When deployed, Rock would have to face situations where his life, the lives of his SEAL teammates, and innocent civilians were at stake. He would have to make split-second decisions and make the right calls. On the battlefield, if Rock froze up and failed to engage an enemy fighter, he might get himself or others killed. If he made a bad decision and misidentified an unarmed civilian as an enemy combatant, it might cost the life of an innocent person. That could also get Rock sent to prison. We simply could not have someone who wasn't ready to step up and make things happen, to execute in high-pressure situations as a member of the platoon or the task unit. But there was another angle to this that I wasn't sure Leif fully understood, and another thing that made this dichotomy a challenge to balance. You know if we get rid of him, we won't get a replacement, I said. You will be a man short for the rest of workup and probably for our deployment as well. You don't think we could get a replacement for him? Leif asked. Not likely. As you know, there aren't enough SEALs, I said. That's the way it is. Every platoon at every team is scrounging for guys. If you let Rock go, don't count on getting another guy. So you need to ask yourself, do you want Charlie Platoon to be a man short? Leif stood quietly shaking his head, grappling with how to proceed. Think about it, I said. Are there other jobs he could do? Maybe keep him out of the assault train? How about using him as a driver or a turret gunner in one of your vehicles? Maybe he could be in charge of marshalling prisoners. There are a lot more jobs we need filled besides door kickers. But even in those roles, we need Rock to make decisions, Leif commented. Even in those roles, he will still be put in situations I don't think he can handle. True. I agreed. But maybe he's just a little slow on the uptake. Maybe he just needs more time to get a grasp on all this. Even if he only works in the rear, in the camp, for this platoon rotation, maybe next time he'll get up to speed. Work with him some more. Have Tony and the boys work with him. Let's see if he can fulfill some kind of role that helps the platoon. Roger that, Leif said. Makes sense. We'll do everything we can. With that, Leif walked away, clearly with the intent to figure out a way to succeed with Rock. If they couldn't get him fully up to speed, perhaps they could at least get him to a point where he would have the skill set to handle some of the less dynamic jobs, where there was a lower probability of his being overwhelmed by tasks and getting himself or somebody else killed. Our CQC training continued on, and with each day the intensity picked up. We graduated to clearing larger buildings with more rooms and more complex hallways and more threats. We moved on to even more difficult problems, 
simultaneous entries into the kill house by two separate assault forces, live explosive breaching charges, and dealing with even greater numbers of prisoners and unarmed civilians. I observed Rock closely on some of the runs to see how he was doing. Leif was right. He was really straining to stay on track. Because I had to keep an eye on 40 more SEALs in the task unit, especially the platoon leadership, I couldn't focus my attention solely on Rock. But I saw enough to understand that his performance was well below that of his peers, the other guys in Charlie and Delta platoons. Still, I didn't see him commit one single blunder so egregious that we'd be forced to fire him. But he did acquire more safety violations, and I constantly heard the instructor cadre counseling him. Even still, Charlie Platoon continued to keep Rock as part of the team. Leif, Tony, and the rest of the platoon kept working with him to try and help him improve. Task Unit Bruiser wrapped up our CQC training and went on the next multi-week training block, then the next. Finally, we arrived at our last training block called Special Reconnaissance, or SR. SR was where platoons would spend extensive periods of time in the field off base, on the training battlefield, to observe and pass reports from clandestine observation positions. The point of this training was to sneak and peek and get out of the area before the enemy even knew you were there, so there wouldn't be any shooting or quick decisions to be made. The stress level was a lot lower, and I figured Rock would be able to handle it. I touched base with Leif and Tony. How's Rock doing? I asked Tony. Not too good. Even here, he can't seem to get it together, Tony responded. Yeah, he's still making mistakes. Simple stuff. I don't know. I see a little glimmer of hope now and then, but he is definitely struggling, Leif added. Well, we are almost done with workup, I said. We need to make a decision. If you guys have done everything you can and he's still not able, we might have to let him go. Got it, boss, Tony said. Check, Leif responded. This was going to be one of the hardest decisions that we were forced to make as a task unit up until this point. The challenge of balancing when to keep working with someone to improve and deciding when it was time to let that person go isn't easy. Leif and Charlie Platoon headed out on another operation in the field for a couple of days. When they came back, Leif came straight to me. I think we crossed the line on this last operation, Jocko, he said. Rock had some simple tasks out there. No pressure, no stress, but he failed at all of them. We had to pull him off those tasks and give his job to others. Luckily, they picked up the slack and we accomplished our mission, but it made it a lot tougher with Rock along. Not only did he not contribute, his deficiencies dragged the rest of the team down. It's clear to me there's nothing else we can do. Leif shook his head. I hate this, he continued. Rock's a good man, but he just gets overwhelmed. He's a danger to himself and everybody else. He just can't get to where we need him to be. I think we need to let him go. It's a hard decision, especially because I know you like him, I told Leif. We all like Rock, Leif replied. He tries. He's got heart. But he's proven over and over again that he just can't do the job. I'm afraid Rock is going to hurt himself, hurt someone else, or get someone hurt, especially once we get into combat. I feel I owe it to Rock to not put him in a situation so far beyond his capability. If he makes a bad decision and gets someone hurt or killed, Rock will have to carry that guilt for the rest of his life. I can't, in good conscience, let that happen. You're right, Leif, and I know you've done everything you can to get him up to speed, I assured him. I have, Jocko, I really have. We all have, Leif replied. I sat quiet for a minute, thinking about it. It was a hard decision, the hardest. When you fire someone in the SEAL teams, you are ripping out their heart, smashing their dreams, taking them from their friends, ruining their career, and taking away their livelihood. It is not to be taken lightly. But at the same time, there is an even heavier burden the lives of all the other men in the platoon, men who count on every SEAL being able to do his job and do it well. 
we all had to be capable of watching each other's backs. And that's all there was to it. Another factor that weighed on my decision was equally important. Charlie Platoon was Leif's platoon. He was the leader. I needed to trust his judgment. This was his toughest leadership decision yet as a platoon commander. Sure, he had made decisions during training operations and directed the day-to-day function of a platoon. But none of those decisions would have the same repercussions on one of his men as firing Rock. This would permanently impact Rock's life. But Leif had thought long and hard about it, and so had I. We had done our utmost to find balance in the dichotomy. On the one hand, we wanted to be loyal to Rock. We wanted Rock to succeed and have a great career as a SEAL. But on the other hand, we had to be loyal to the greater team, to Charlie Platoon, to Task Unit Bruiser, and above all, to our mission. We had to ensure everyone on the team could pull their weight. Rock couldn't. We needed to do the right thing. The hard thing. All right, then, I said. We will pull him out of the platoon and send him back to the team for a Trident review board. With that, Leif and Tony called a meeting with Rock. They explained the situation to him, why they had made the decision, and what would happen next. Rock would have to await the results of the Trident review board. The Trident was what we called the SEAL Warfare Insignia Pin a large golden eagle, flintlock pistol, anchor, and trident we wore on our uniforms. A trident review board consisted of the most experienced SEALs at the team, the non-commissioned officers, SEAL chiefs, senior chiefs, and master chiefs. They would review Rock's case to decide whether he would continue as a SEAL and get another chance in a SEAL platoon down the road, or whether to pull his trident and send him away to a non-SEAL command in the U.S. Navy surface fleet. The board reviewed Rock's case, examined his safety violations, and heard testimony about his performance from Tony and Charlie Platoon's leading petty officer. The decision was clear. The board ruled that Rock's trident be removed and that he be sent to the fleet. He would no longer be a SEAL, no longer be part of the SEAL teams. Rock wasn't happy about it. Yet, while he was upset to no longer be in the SEAL teams, at the same time, he showed some signs of relief. Relief from the stress of trying to do a job he wasn't capable of performing well. Although he was disappointed, he maintained a positive attitude and went on to have a successful career in the Navy. In Ramadi, in the toughest combat situations I could have envisioned for us, Task Unit Bruiser performed as an exceptional team. The extensive training, mentorship, and guidance that had been passed on was critical to this. But our exceptional performance was also a function of making the tough decisions to let underperformers go. But resorting to the extreme of firing someone was the exception. On the other side of this dichotomy were the other four new guys in Charlie Platoon who excelled under the mentorship, coaching, and special effort made by the platoon leadership and experienced SEALs. While each new guy struggled at times, all of them, with the exception of Rock, got up to speed. Charlie Platoon's veteran SEALs worked with them, trained with them, counseled them, and drove them to become upstanding members of Charlie Platoon and of the SEAL teams. And that attitude of doing everything you can to help your subordinates, peers, and leaders be the best they can possibly be was critical to the success of Charlie Platoon and Task Unit Bruiser. But that attitude had to be balanced by knowing when we, as leaders, had done everything we could to help an individual get up to speed. But the individual still fell short, and the decision had to be made to let him go. Principle. Most underperformers don't need to be fired, they need to be led. But once every effort has been made to help an underperformer improve and all efforts have failed, a leader has to make the tough call to let that person go. This is the duty and responsibility of every leader. Leaders are responsible for the output of the individuals on their team. 
The goal of any leader is to get the most out of every individual, to push each individual to reach his or her maximum potential so that the team itself can reach its maximum potential. Conversely, leaders must also understand that human beings have limitations. Not every person on a team will be suited for a particular job. Some people might need a less technical position. Some people can't handle stress. Some might not work well with others. Some might lack the creativity to come up with new ideas or solve problems. This doesn't mean they are worthless. It just means that the leader needs to utilize them in a position where their strengths are fully capitalized. Once again, the leader is still trying to maximize the potential of every individual. Occasionally, there are people who simply cannot perform to the required level in any capacity. Once a leader has exhausted remedial measures through coaching, mentoring, and counseling, the leader then must make the tough call. Remove that individual from the team. The dichotomy in this situation is balancing between taking care of individuals by keeping them around even if they lack the skill set to do the job properly and protecting the team by removing people from positions where they negatively impact the team and the mission. A leader must be loyal to his individual team members and take care of them, but at the same time he must be loyal to the team itself and ensure that every member of the team has a net positive impact and doesn't detract from mission execution. One thing that causes problems with this dichotomy is the idea of extreme ownership. With extreme ownership, we say, no bad teams, only bad leaders. When leaders try to live by that mantra, it usually has a positive outcome. When a leader has a substandard individual on the team, that leader takes ownership of the individual and ensures that the individual gets the training, coaching, and mentoring needed to get up to speed. That personal investment usually pays dividends. The substandard individual improves and becomes a solid contributor to the team. But sometimes, the substandard individual doesn't improve. Sometimes, he or she can't improve. Sometimes, the individual simply lacks the necessary skills, capacity, or attitude to do a job. So, the leader takes ownership of it and continues to invest time, energy, and money into the individual, but the individual's capabilities still don't improve. As the leader continues investing time and resources into one individual, other members of the team and other priorities are neglected, and the team can begin to falter. Also, as other team members see a leader pouring resources into one non-performing individual, the team might question the leader's judgment. This is when leaders must bring their efforts into balance. Instead of focusing on one individual, leaders must remember that there is a team and that the performance of the team trumps the performance of a single individual. Instead of continuing to invest in one subpar performer, once a concerted effort has been made to coach and train that individual to no avail, the leader must remove the individual. It can be one of the hardest decisions a leader has to make, but it is the right one. We are often asked, when is the right time to fire someone? Some leaders are too quick to pull the trigger and fire people without giving them the right guidance and enough opportunity to gain competency. Other leaders wait to let someone go even after the individual has shown no potential at becoming competent and is negatively impacting the team. The answer is this. When a leader has done everything possible to get an individual up to speed without seeing results, the time has come to let that individual go. Don't be too quick to fire, but don't wait too long. Find the balance and hold the line. Application to business. The Tower 2 Super just doesn't seem to know how to get things done. They are lagging behind Tower 1 by six days right now, the project manager told me and the regional vice president referring to the superintendent in charge of one of the two condominium towers they were building? Six days behind, the VP asked? Doesn't that throw everything off track? It absolutely does, the project manager answered. 
We are having to repeat the same events instead of getting them done at once. Things like concrete pours and crane movements. It costs us time and money. That isn't good, the VP said. This is the only project I'm a part of that is off schedule. Well, I'm doing the best I can with what I've got, said the project manager. The Tower 2 Super just isn't getting it done. I looked at the VP and gave him a nod. I could tell he was thinking what I was thinking. We had already put this whole team through a course on extreme ownership, yet this project manager was casting blame and making excuses. The VP wasn't having any of that. Whose fault is it that the Tower 2 Super isn't getting it done? The VP asked. Immediately, the project manager recognized what was being implied. The look on his face changed, and he started shaking his head. How can it be my fault? He asked. He's the one running Tower 2, not me. Well, what are you getting paid for then? The VP asked, going strong, maybe a little too strong, at the project manager. The project manager didn't answer. The VP backed off. I mean, seriously, you are the project manager, the VP continued. Tower 2 is part of this project. If the Tower 2 super isn't doing his job, who is supposed to fix him? I've been trying to fix him, the project manager countered. But like I said, he just doesn't seem to get it. Okay, then, I interjected. If he truly doesn't get it, then why is he still in that position? If I had a platoon commander or a squad leader who was failing repeatedly, they would be out of a job. That's easier said than done, the project manager insisted. This job has a lot of baggage behind it. We've had to clean up a lot of stuff from the architects and engineers. This isn't an easy job, and he has a lot of knowledge that any other super wouldn't have if we brought someone new on board. That knowledge is critical to this project. Well, this clearly isn't working, said the VP. All right, all right, the project manager protested. Let me talk to him some more. While you are talking, you better prepare for action, I said, thinking that this might require the removal of the superintendent from Tower 2. I'm prepared, the project manager said. No, beyond you being prepared, we need to be legally prepared, the VP said. What do you mean? he asked. Well, let's look at the situation, I told him. You say you've talked to him already. That obviously isn't working. Now, maybe you need to be more direct with him. Tell him exactly where he is failing and what he needs to do to improve. You also need to give him a warning that the next time you talk to him about this, you are putting it in writing. And then, if he doesn't fix himself, you need to actually put it in writing. The company must prepare to take action to terminate him if he doesn't improve. And all indicators are that he won't improve. So you need to prepare the situation so that he can be terminated without legal blowback. But what if he does improve, the project manager asked, clearly fearful of my guidance. If he does improve, that's great, I said. Problem solved. We could move on. No factor. But if he doesn't, then you'll be ready. But won't it ruin his attitude if I write him up, the project manager said? It might. But think about where we're at, I countered. You and I had this discussion early on. You put him through an escalation of counseling. You started with a friendly conversation. He didn't change. You asked him how you could help him change. He didn't change. You told him directly what he needed to change. He didn't change. You gave him plenty of opportunity, and so far, he has made no improvement. It's clear you've made an effort not to put too much pressure on him or be too negative, I continued. It simply hasn't been effective. The next step in the escalation is to tell him he's going to be written up, which is a final plea for him to fix himself. But if he doesn't, you have to move further up the escalation of counseling. You will need to write him up. And of course, there is a chance that will help him. It might make him finally realize how serious you are and how serious the situation is. You owe it to him to make it clear where his deficiencies are and to help him improve. If that happens and he gets his act together, great. But if that doesn't happen, you need to be ready to act accordingly. Having a documented formal counseling will make termination easier. Plus, the work you have done to help him, to coach him, to mentor him, and to make clear 
that his performance is substandard and must improve is ultimately to his benefit. I explain that one of the things that makes it so hard to fire someone is the leader's knowledge that they have not done everything to actually lead a poor performer. As leaders, we feel bad when we haven't done enough. We haven't trained, we haven't mentored, we haven't led, and it makes us feel guilty, and rightly so. If you have done all you can as a leader, I said, if you have given him direct feedback on his deficiencies, coached and mentored him, and given him ample opportunity to correct himself, then getting rid of a subpar performer isn't just the right thing to do, it's the only thing to do. Anything less is letting down the team. Does that make sense? It does make sense, but it doesn't solve the other problem at all, the project manager said. What problem is that, the VP interjected. The problem of replacing him. This is a complex job. And like I said, there are all kinds of issues, answered the project manager. If I have to fire him, who else could I bring in that could get a grip on this job? Who said you would have to bring someone in, I asked. Why not just bring someone up? Bring someone up? The project manager asked. Absolutely, I replied. You've got a whole job sites, really two job sites worth of people out there. Are there no capable leaders among them? Do you not think there's anyone who could step into the role of superintendent and lead? Maybe, he replied without much enthusiasm. With that, the project manager walked back to his trailer, and the VP and I made the rounds talking to the troops and leaders on the job site. Overall, they had great crews of experienced workers making steady progress on both towers. In fact, many of the crews were actually bouncing back and forth between towers doing work on both. The two teams are basically equivalent, the VP said to me. Yeah, they are. Isn't it amazing how one tower is doing so well and the other isn't? I said with a hint of sarcasm in my voice. We both knew exactly what was happening here. No bad teams, only bad leaders, the VP said, quoting the chapter from Extreme Ownership that explained how when a team is failing, it is the leader's fault. The Tower 2 Super isn't working out, and the project manager won't do anything about it. Indeed, I replied. That is some bad leadership, isn't it? It sure is, the VP replied, fading off at the end as he realized what I was really saying. He gave me an inquisitive yet knowing look. I simply nodded. This is on me, isn't it? The VP said. You are the leader, I replied. He stood for a moment looking across the construction site. Then he looked at me and said, I get it. You get what? I replied. I get it. I get that everything you just said to the project manager, you might as well have been saying to me, the VP observed. If the Tower 2 Super isn't working out, and the project manager isn't doing anything about it, that is actually my fault, and I need to fix it. That is extreme ownership, I acknowledged. The VP was quiet for a few moments. Then he said, Okay, I get that too, but here's the problem. The Tower 2 Super, he's a good guy. He's worked other jobs for us before and done just fine. And the project manager? He can get it done. Look at Tower 1. I want to take care of these guys. Sure, the project manager can get it done, but he is not, I noted. And are you really taking care of these guys by letting the project fall behind, letting them fail? This is one of the dichotomies of leadership, balancing between when to keep people to coach them and mentor them until they get up to speed and when to make the call that they are hurting the team and get rid of them. Of course, when you coach and mentor and try to help them, you're going to develop a relationship with them. You're going to build trust. But as a leader, if you are investing too much time into one person, that means others are being ignored. Also, if a member of the team isn't able to perform effectively, it is likely impacting the mission as a whole. I think that is where you are with this situation. You are letting the project manager deal with the super, but he isn't doing it well and the whole job is suffering. You need to get in there and get it fixed. I do, the VP agreed. I'll make it happen. He asked for some time alone with the project manager. 
I went and talked to some of the contractors on the job and learned more about how the leadership interacted with them as contractors. An hour or so later, the VP texted me and told me he was in his trailer and wanted to debrief the conversation with the project manager, so I headed to his trailer. That was easier than I thought, he said. That's good. What did you tell him? I asked. First, I told him that I liked him and thought he was very capable, the VP said. But then I told him he was failing, and that if he was failing, I was failing. Then I explained that if I was failing, I needed to take ownership of the situation and fix it. How did he like that, I asked, expecting that the project manager would get defensive and ask him to back off a little and let him do his job. Surprisingly, he didn't mind, answered the VP. Really? I asked, surprised. I think he needs some help with the hard decisions, the VP said, and I think he knows that. So I told him to give an extremely firm written counseling to the super of Tower 2. And at the same time, I told him to find someone who could step up and take over Tower 2. That was his biggest concern. He didn't think anyone in Tower 2 was ready to step up. But I told him to look at some of the guys from Tower 1. They have the same information. And they have the benefit of having followed a good leader on Tower 1 for the last six months. They know what they are supposed to do. And they've already seen it done right. He liked that idea, and immediately offered a couple names that could potentially pull it off. I think this is going to work out pretty well. That's great. At least the talk went great, I said. Now comes the hard part, execution. The project manager has to have some tough conversations with the superintendent. Those conversations are hard. And if the conversations don't work, he may have to terminate the superintendent. It's tough to go from trying to coach and help someone to firing them. But as a leader, it is unfortunately a dichotomy you have to deal with, I told him. Over the next few weeks, I was not on the job site, but I received regular updates from the VP. He and the project manager executed the plan. The project manager wrote up the Tower 2 superintendent. The VP and project manager worked together to identify and speak with the best possible candidate from Tower 1 to step up and become the superintendent of Tower 2. After three weeks and three written counseling sessions, the super from Tower 2 made no improvement, so they let him go. The project manager elevated a new superintendent into position and pressed on with this new leadership in place. Because of the relationship between the Tower 1 super and the new Tower 2 super, the Tower 1 Super went out of his way to get the new Tower 2 Super up to speed, even giving him manpower and resources to get them caught up in an excellent example of cover and move. And although Tower 1 did finish ahead of Tower 2, Tower 2 team's performance radically improved once the proper balance was found between continuing to coach the underperforming superintendent and deciding it was time to remove and replace him with good leadership.